right. Welcome to understanding the basics of the Clean Water Act and agriculture. I'm seeing some people saying that the screen is blurry. I'm wondering if that was just our video. It's good now. Okay, so maybe that was just our video, our, our um, pre-video. Okay, great. glad we cleared that up. My name is Audrey Thompson. I'm a staff attorney here with the Penn State Center for Agricultural and Shale Law and the director of this Understanding Ag Agricultural Law program series. Um, the Understanding Agricultural Law Educational Series is a course designed to provide subject matter literacy and competence on fundamental issues of agricultural law to attorneys and business advisors who work with or represent agricultural or rural clients, but who may not necessarily specialize in agricultural law. This series is wholly sponsored by the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture's Ag Business Development Center, established through the 2019 Pennsylvania Farm Bill. The Agricultural Business Development Center aims to enhance the long-term vitality of Pennsylvania farms by supporting farm transitions, both from generation to generation and from conventional to organic farming, supporting beginning farmers, providing risk management education, and providing financial assistance through low interest loans and grants. Next slide, please. As you can see, we have covered numerous topics so far, including ag labor and the Fair Labor Standards Act, ag cooperatives, finance, farm credit system, crop insurance, conservation programs, Pennsylvania's clean and green, and many, many, many more. You can find uh, resources and materials on our website, and I'm putting some links in the chat here um, for all of these webinars on our Understanding Ag Law landing page on our website at aglaw.psu.edu. We've got some upcoming topics and events here. I'll put another link in the chat. Um, you can find it at our events. We've uh, Next month, we've got Understanding the Basics of Agritourism. And then in August, we've got Understanding the Basics of the H-2A program. Those are both on Fridays and at noon. Registration is up and available for those. And then in July, we've got our um, Dairy Quarterly Legal Webinar. That is going to be part two of U.S. State Milk Pricing and Supports. Um, covering the Western states. And then we are very excited to start announcing, uh, I guess officially, our Pennsylvania Agricultural Law Symposium on September 19th, 2024. That's going to be in person here at Penn State Law and University Park at the Katz Building from 8.30 to 4.30 that day, kind of an all-day event. We're going to offer six CLEs. Topics right now, uh, we are looking at tw uh, the Ag Law Year in Review, Biosolids and Food Processing Waste Legal Issues, Ag cooperatives, car uh, carbon credits and contracts, farm labor contractors and H-2A workers, and then ethical issues in farm family representation. We're still getting presenters uh, solidified for that, but we, we're, we're very much um, almost done. Um, we've got the information up on our event site for the symposium, but we do not have registration available just yet. It will be a, a priced registration um, and all of that that's available on our website right now, just not registration yet. So mark your calendars for what's going to be, we think, a really great CLE event in September. Uh, next slide, please. And then finally, just a couple of housekeeping issues before we get started here. I'm putting a form in the chat right now. I will also put that form uh, in the chat multiple times. Um, this webinar is being recorded. If you have any questions, please use the Q&A feature. I will collect those and ask them at the end. We encourage you to fill out the survey at the end of this webinar. Please tell us what you like, what we can improve, and what topics you'd like to see in the future. And if you want to submit this program for a free CLE to the PACLE board, or if you want us to send you an attendance certificate that you can submit to your state CLE board, I just posted that link in the chat. Um, you're going to need to fill that out to get your credits. And as part of our responsibility, we will provide you a code word later in the program that you must enter into that uh, form. I don't think I see any phone-ins, um, but if anyone is on the phone, please send me an email and I will send you that form. So, all right, I will now turn this webinar over to Brooke Doerr, the center's senior staff attorney. Brooke joined the Center for Agricultural and Shell Law in 2019. Prior to coming to the center, Brooke served as chief counsel to the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture and before joining PDA, he practiced law in Lancaster County for 18 years. Brooke, the screen is yours. Thanks, Audrey. Good morning, everyone, or good afternoon. It's a beautiful day here in the mid-Atlantic region. Uh, don't know what type of distribution we have for our attendees between Pennsylvania and uh, other areas, uh, but we will go forward with our usual approach, which is a, a presentation that is to some degree at a general level, you know, a beginner to moderate level. Um, and uh, as Audrey said, uh, many of the uh, uh, 
our presentations in this particular series are geared towards general practitioners or people that practice in rural areas who might not be that familiar. So if you're already in this issue and you're already got your head all in it, you may, this may be a little bit um, uh, uh, sort of at, at the entry level uh, fit, uh for you, but um, we'll go forward uh, and hopefully people get uh, a good uh, um, uh, pick up a few tips here and there. Um, <clears throat> they, Before you get started, yes. I apologize. I do see a couple people on the phone. If you are on the phone and you need the CLE, please send me an email at AET17 at PSU.edu. That's AET17 at PSU.edu. All right. Thank you. Thanks. Obviously, the Clean Water Act and agriculture is our title. Clean Water Act is such an expansive uh, federal statute in terms of, you know, the statute itself isn't all that long, but, you know, the, the regs and the programs that, you know, have arisen from it over the years, you know, we, there's just no way to touch it all. So um, let's uh, go over the agenda just a little bit so I can clarify what we will cover and what we won't cover. Now, the good news is that we are going to begin to devote some uh some of these sessions in this series to some drill downs on much more specific topics and portions of the Clean Water Act um, as they impact agriculture. Uh, so what we're going to talk about first is uh, Clean uh, Water Act uh, and the history and just you know, the basic statutory foundations and uh, briefly. Then we're going to talk about the core functioning of the Clean Water Act as it's applied to agriculture and a, a little bit about food production operations uh, of various kinds and how the Clean Water Act comes in to play uh, with regard to those operations. Um, you know, the core functions, the MPDES permitting, and particularly with regard to as applied to agriculture, CAFO permitting uh, is going to be a big uh, portion of what we're going to talk about here because it really is sort of this real core function and um, uh, is certainly, you know, it's the place where agriculture is specifically mentioned in, you know, a, a statute from 1972 um, about clean water in all of its aspects. Uh, now, we're also going to talk a little bit about meat and poultry processing, MPDES permitting also. Um, and then we're going to talk about um, a little bit about uh, industrial stormwater MPDES permitting for food manufacturers, which is something I you really, you know, rarely ever uh, run across. Um, now, what we won't be covering yet um, is state law clean water quality uh, regulatory schemes, including Pennsylvania's. Um, that's, that's sort of for a, another presentation. We only have an hour. We're not going to talk about the WOTUS rule litigation history details. Uh, even, even those of you on the periphery are probably uh, uh, pretty tired of hearing uh, all about that. Um, certainly an, an extensive litigation history, shall we say. Interesting, we, we live in interesting times. There's been so, uh, there's been Maybe what we'd say with two somewhat seismic, uh, you know, changes in that area in the last couple of years that kind of wipe away, assuming that there isn't any overturning of recent uh, uh, actions, um, wipe away uh, a lot of the just just volumes and volumes of of. of uh, analysis and litigation and, uh, you know, a treatise on, you know, the WOTUS rule now becomes, you know, somewhat short if you take out all of the uh, somewhat uh, past history that is no longer relevant. Um, we're not going to talk about the Chesapeake Bay and the obligations of Pennsylvania or any of the other um, the watershed uh, uh, states. Uh, that's for another day. And uh, we're not going to talk about the specifics of the Clean Water Act functions applicable to general things beyond agriculture. For And, and I put an example in there, you know, um, for example, construction permits for greater than one acre of earth disturbance. That's a general thing. It applies to agriculture, applies to everybody. So we're not going to talk about those kind of things. And the one area that I had to kind of excise out of here because it was just not going to fit was uh, pesticide application and MPDES permits. So you can guarantee that will be a future topic. Um, all right. Now let's go forward. I'm old enough to remember when everybody was screaming Lake Erie's on fire. And this was the national news, six o'clock news. You turn it on when I was a kid and you'd see Walter Cronkite talking about uh, Lake Erie burning. Well, it wasn't really Lake Erie. In 1969, it was the Cuyahoga River that empties out into Lake Erie in Cleveland, of course. Um, 
And uh, and, and here's an interesting photo of a uh, political cartoon there that just points out it was the Cuyahoga River. And then here's, you know, one of the dramatic images of, you know, uh, all sorts of emergency services, people trying to put out the lake, so to speak, so that it did not burn everything that was all the cr vessels, et cetera, that were sitting on top of it. So that was a watershed event. I mean, that that really has not only given, you know, the uh, or gave the late night comedians a lot of jokes for years, um, but um, it is what essentially led to what we now call the Clean Water Act. Um, the uh, history was there There was an existing statute, uh, the Federal Water Pollution Control Act, which actually is still uh the, the title in the U you know USC and the, you go in there it's still called that at the you know uh, at the title page um but uh in 1972 after Lake Erie caught fire um and other things uh, Earth Day all the different things that were happening in that window of time uh there was a collective set of amendments to the Federal Water Pollution Control Act uh that were enacted as uh, what we now call the Clean Water Act and uh, it was basically a complete rewrite of of the way that the statute worked. And of course, here's a link. I like to throw a lot of links where I can into my PowerPoints. Um, so get yourself a copy of the PowerPoint. And you know where you can find some of this stuff. Um, officially, it was changed. The name was changed to the Clean Water Act in 1977. But if you go in the U.S. code, it's still sitting there at the top of the page as Federal Water Pollution Control Act. Uh, prior to this amendment in 72, the way the law, you know, uh, read was it, it employed ambient water quality standards specific specifying the acceptable levels of pollution in a state's interstate navigable waters in other words it's judging the waters um and as a whole and uh it was essentially dealing with just the water quality standard of the of the water in that body of water uh it was not directed towards uh you know who's doing the discharging uh, and where's it all? And where are these uh, substances coming from? And creating a system to control it in that manner. Um, so you know that's what uh, alarmed people, as it probably should have, if you're trying to uh, accomplish something uh, with regard to water quality improvements. Um, so the two objectives of the Clean Water Act were regulate discharge of pollutants into waters of the United States. All the key uh, legal terms are in uh, bolded here. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about what a discharge is, what a pollutant is. And of course, we all know that there's all sorts of legal issues that have gone on for years and taken, you know, millions, if not, you know, millions of hours of attorney time, let's just put it this way, and judge in courtroom time on what is the water of the United States. In any event, the, the word that's actually used in the Clean Water Act is navigable waters. Um, and sometimes it, you slip it, they slipped it in different uh, times where they would just say interstate waters. Um uh, but there is no definition of waters in the United States in the statute. Maybe people are aware of that already. Um, the the term this is it. This little one sentence here. The term navigable waters means the waters of the United States, including the territorial seas. And territorial seas means three miles out from the low tide mark, or what they call the line of ordinary low water. So um, that it's quite amazing the way some statutes uh, you know were born and raised shall we say um in today's society uh, uh and have survived all this time with something like that as the only definition of what exactly it applies to what discharges uh you know or into what waters uh does this attempt to control uh Pretty miraculous. Now, of course, the, the navigable waters, you know, is a borrowed term from the common law. And uh, so, you know, that is where it all goes. And I guess at the time, that's what they thought was that th this would somehow be worked out, you know, uh, all come out in the wash somehow by, you know, applying common law rules and principles. Um, probably safe to say it didn't quite work out that way. Uh, but in any event, if you remember some of the things that you might have learned, uh, if you in fact your attorney, don't want to say anything, I hope we have some non-attorneys here also. Um, you know, navigable waters, you know, was, uh, you know, used in commerce, you know, in other words, you know, uh, something like the Susquehanna River that we have here is in fact a non-navigable water. Uh, now it leads to a navigable water. It has the, the right connections to be called water of the United States, but uh, technically it wasn't a navigable water for many parts of its life because it's too shallow. 
um, to conduct commerce on it. But in any event, we don't need to worry about that commerce standard because um, there is a whole other sort of uh, structure placed in there. So anyway, that's number one objective, di regulate discharge pollutants into waters of the United States. Number two is regulate water quality standards of surface waters. That means uh, more than, you know, just the navigable waters. Um, now, today we're going to talk about number one mostly. We're not going to talk about number two. Number two is where you get into, let's say, the one area that I mentioned, Chesapeake Bay uh, obligations. That would fall under number two. Uh, and that's not really what we're going to cover today just because we only have an hour. Now, there are other definitions. Okay, here we go. What's a pollutant? This is a quite a definition. And again, these are all the products of, you know, a 1972 law. Probably see something much different today. Uh, it means dredged spoil, which is actually not a typo. It's spoil, not soil. Uh, you know, spoil was the things produced by dredging. Uh, solid waste. And then a lot of things in here that, you know, not necessarily related to agriculture per se. Um, but then it says uh, way towards the end. I like this one here, cellar dirt. I don't know what cellar dirt is, but. Um, and then cellar dirt and industrial, I probably got some cellar dirt, actually, industrial, municipal, and agricultural waste discharged into water. Okay, so there's, you know, the word agriculture appears right in the definition of pollutant. And, you know, let's just say it this way. As this term has come to be uh, interpreted, of course, it also means uh, soil components uh, of just any kind, really, um, that are uh, in one way, shape, or form discharged into water. Now, what's a discharge? Um, <clears throat> any addition of any pollutant to navigable waters from any point source. And again, soil runoff, you know, top loss of, you know, any component of topsoil, uh, you know, essentially is now considered to be, uh, you know, and by stormwater runoff, it, you know, theoretically is a discharge of a pollutant. Any addition of any uh, pollutant to navigable waters from any point source, and there's the, the key phrase point source, which we'll talk a lot about uh, appearing right in here. Any addition of any pollutant to waters of the contiguous zone or the ocean from any point source other than a vessel. Um, so, um, mostly A is the, where the important definitional terminology comes into play. So these things have taken on a gloss over time, uh, to mean what they mean today. Um, now, uh, look at these goals, wildly ambitious. Let's just put them, you know, let's just say congressional declaration of policies and tight or goals and policy is the, is the title of the very first section. It's the national goal that discharge of pollutants into the navigable waters be eliminated by 1985. Boy, that was ambitious, huh? Uh, needless to say, uh, that's uh, <laughs> the jury's still out on achieving that one. But uh, there is, of course, a, a system in place um, to try to reach that. It's the national goal that water quality, which provides for the protection and propagation of fish, shellfish, and wildlife, and provides for recreational in and recreation, sorry, in and out, in and on the water, be achieved by July 1, 1983. So that was even a more ambitious goal there. Um, so I, it just gives you a little flavor of uh, the high hopes um, in 1972. Um, now, the prior focus, again, as I said, was on the aggregate level of pollution in a given body of water. For example, the Cuyahoga River, Lake Erie, both of which were clearly navigable waters. Um, as to vote, and it was uh, concentrating on that as opposed to the preventable causes. So... Sounds pretty logical. Yeah, we got to get start looking at where all this is coming from, not just assess what the quality of Lake Erie is and, you know, uh, uh, and then attempt to use some tools that we might have at our disposal and at the federal level to, to deal with that. Enforcement of the standards required working backwards from an overpolluted body of water to determine which point sources are responsible and to abate them. Nice statement. I, I, actually, I believe that comes from uh, um, it's 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 a statement uh, right out of I forget what which case it was. Um, this idea of the working backwards from an over polluted uh, body of water um, uh, kind of illustrates uh, cats already in the bag out of the bag to some degree need to go back further than that. So the two new approaches in the Clean Water Act were directly regulating discharges from point sources. Boy, that sounds simple, but it wasn't going on. 
uh, by setting what's called effluent limitations. That's a term of art. It's it's everywhere. It's in everything that has to do with um, uh, at least the uh, National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System, the MPDES system for permitting discharges into waters of the United States. Effluent limitations uh, exist and are incorporated into every single permit. And the effluent limitations uh, govern quantities, rates, and concentrations of pollutants contained. Um, and, uh, you know, the effluent limitations for very, there are books and books of them, or, you know, hundreds of pages worth of effluent limitations uh, that apply to various types of discharges from various types of discharge-ers. Um, and they're all quantified by what business they're in, et cetera. Um, so... Uh, one thing to think about just in terms of the theoretical portions of the MPDES permitting is uh, there are different kinds of controls in an MPDES permit. Uh, you know, technology-based effluent limitations, which are formulated uh, based upon what is the uh, pollution control technology. Um, so that's incorporated in when uh, uh, possible. And of course, these effluent limitations are set by regulation. They're not in the statute. And that's been years of regulation promulgation, promulgation, which continues to this day. Water quality based effluent limitations, which are simply like sort of like a performance standard. It's just, you know, based on the amounts and kinds of pollutants that are in the water uh, to which you're going to discharge. Um, and then there are sometimes narrative conditions in there that describe how you're to do a certain thing um, you know, that you're doing on land to um, try to achieve compliance with the more technical uh, uh, water quality-based uh, uh, measurements that are in the other two um, uh, types of limitations. So all three of these kinds of concepts are woven into the permitting system, uh, and sometimes not without some degree of controversy. Um, you know, how, how do you prove that these narrative uh, conditions, for example, um, actually achieve, uh, you know, something that might be a water quality based effluent limitation? Um, and, uh, you know, so sometimes that these all of these things can create controversies in and of themselves. And of course, technology based, you know, how expensive is it going or how expensive are we going to make it to be in, for example, the you know, poultry processing industry um, or in the, uh, you know, uh, in the raising of poultry even. Um, uh, so all those things work together to sort of create the, the uh, standards that appear they, you know, in different forms in the MPDES permits. Um, and they all create their own little political issues and legal worlds. Now, the underlying concepts this is this first bullet point is really important to the whole system because it does, in, you know, sort of infect the dialogue and discussion of, you know, MPDES permitting and, you know, um, and the grievances, let's just say, over it. If an MPDES permit holder complies with the conditions of the permit, as it's set, then that discharger will be deemed to be in compliance with the Clean Water Act. That's a really important uh, aspect of this because that means that um, you get your permit, you do the things that the permit says, and theoretically, there is not a, a an additional um, portion of the permit that, in, in all cases, begun to develop more, but in monitoring what's actually being discharged from your uh, property when you, in fact, have done the things that the permit says you're to do. So the idea is that um, you're kind of taking it on faith that if you do what the government told you to do in the permit, that uh, you're deemed to be in compliance regardless of what's actually happening in the real world. That's a concept that is sort of behind a lot of things and can lead to a lot of uh, uncertainty um, uh, and dissatisfaction with the way this system is working. Um, amending the Clean Water Act in ways today that that might alter this is uh, difficult, uh, to say the least, as a political proposition. Uh, there is a lot of controversy afoot uh, in some segments of industry and including agriculture over the concept of 
Well, who's actually measuring the discharges? We know they're doing what the permit says, but is it working? Or what are we getting out the other end, so to speak, into our waters? Um, now, other important concept, and this one has kind of been um, uh, dealt with a little bit in recent, this is sort of one of the sort of seismic you know, changes to some degree is it only covers discharges into surface waters, not to groundwater. Um, in other words, subsurface waters, uh, unless it's the functional equivalent of a direct discharge. Now, that's the new test that was just announced by the U.S. Supreme Court in this County of Maui case, which was decided in 2020. So it was a relatively new um, uh, concept, or at least is a, an attempt to clean up a lot of litigation and a lot of, uh, uh, you know, back and forth and a lot of analysis and legal argument and that had gone on for years over the concepts of um, uh, is a discharge into groundwater um, going to be covered or when will it be covered um, uh, under the Clean Water Act and in your MPDES permit, so to speak. Uh, the County of Maui case kind of swept a lot of that stuff away. Because you look in the treaties and legal, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, you, you look in old analysis of the Clean Water Act, you will see pages and pages of um, uh, discussion of all sorts of cases wrestling with this issue of how do you measure um, uh, or how do you determine um, whether something is really, or, or I'll put it this way, how do you determine the Clean Water Act applies if in fact these are groundwater impacts and discharges into groundwater, not surface waters? So Ma the County of Maui case attempted to sort of clean that up a little bit. We live in a little cleaner world since that case in terms of legal analysis. You know, it depends on which side of the coin you're on otherwise as to whether it was an improvement or not. The case was, of course, uh, if you know anything about it, the county of Maui in Hawaii, you know, living on volcanic you know, formations, um, was discharging the end result of their wastewater treatment uh, facilities directly into the ground. And I forget the number of miles away, but something like between 15 and 25 miles away or so, I think it was, um, you know, there was fairly clear, objectively determinable by lab testing evidence that, in fact, it was just coming out into the uh, Pacific Ocean. Um, and so... Uh, you know, that's essentially what we uh, uh, what we had in the County of Maui case that um, uh, w ended up rendering this decision. Um, OK, now, point source control, that's the terminology that the Clean Water Act and the MPDES permit system is all about that. You know, it's intended to deal with point source discharges only. The other, the, the, the other uh, and again, this is where we're getting into some real basic stuff, so I apologize for those of us, you know, or those people who are, um, uh, you know, uh, maybe uh, very familiar with some of these issues. Diffuse discharges are what's called non-point sources. And, um, and while the regs use the term non-point source, I don't think the statute ever uses that word. Um, uh, now, the term point source has a definition, any discernible, confined, and discrete conveyance, including but not limited to any pipe. That's usually what we say. Point source is a pipe, uh, a ditch, a channel, a tunnel, conduit, well, discrete fissure, container, rolling stock, concentrated uh, animal feeding operation. Well, there you go. Or vessel or other floating craft from which pollutants are or may be discharged. Of course, we did see something about the uh, floating vessels outside the territorial seas, I think it was, um, in one of the prior definitions. Now, the um, um, uh, the non-point sources or these diffuse discharges, i.e. the one we talk about and is sort of pervades everything, of course, is stormwater runoff, uh, are left to the states through state water quality standards and waste management regulations. Because again, this is more than just farming and, you know, uh, obviously landfills, et cetera, all sorts of waste uh, um, destinations, let's just say, um, have, you know, the, the exact same problems and the exact same kind of diffuse discharges. Um, so um, that's the big dichotomy there. Uh, point sources, yes. Non-point sources, um, are the other category. Um, and, uh, um, now there are some diffuse discharges that have now become point sources. For example, take a look at that, uh, concentrated animal feeding operation. 
We'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, we're not talking about a pipe coming out. We're talking about stormwater uh, hitting the ground, um, you know, where the animals, uh, 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 let's just say, are housed and occupy um, and eat, stand and produce manure. Now, state administration of Clean Water Act is important to understand, and we're not going to talk about much about the contents of state laws, but um, this presentation is talking about federal law established by the Clean Water Act, not the contents of state laws. But most states have adopted their own MPDES equivalents under the Clean Water Act, which they're permitted to do. In fact, they're very encouraged to do. And if so, under the Clean Water Act, the EPA shall, it's mandatory, transfer the MPDES permitting authority to that state if they meet, and there's the nine statutory criteria that have to be met for a state MPDES type system. And then the state takes over. Now, there's a patchwork and a crazy quilt across the country, which we'll talk, which we'll look at in a second. Um, as administered by the states, an MPDES, uh, which is a system, in other words, can include requirements or enforcement arising from state law above and beyond the Clean Water Act. So what happens is this is just a word of, uh, uh, of uh, you know, don't get too alarmed, you know, from state to state. The terminology, the requirements, et cetera, of the way in which this uh, MPDES permitting system is being administered by those states, even though it's based on a federal statute and federal regulations, many times the states have added things in and have their own terminologies and their own definitions and their own criteria. Um, and so it's very difficult to compare terminology, criteria, and discussions of MPDES, let's just say CAFO permits, for example, from state to state, you know, you can look at what the federal definition is, but then states have variables. Um, and so it creates a very difficult time in just lumping all this data together and comparing, you know, what's a, what's a CAFO permit in Oregon versus what's a CAFO permit in Pennsylvania, you know, they're really two different things, um, uh, to put it very bluntly. Um, okay, now, um, there's essentially a concurrent jurisdiction of a sort. An individual state may issue MPDES permits for discharges into navigable water within its jurisdiction if the state programs are approved by EPA, or it kind of already said that, but it's actually now right in the statute, and it's, it is right in the statute. The state program must be equal to or stricter than the federal stat standards and then otherwise comply with their regs in, in, in other respects. So that gives you a, a concept of, you know, how a little bit convoluted and you know this can get when you're trying to compare apples to what turns out to be oranges across state lines so to speak now uh epa has a resource uh page with a very nice map where you click on the states and this is the link for it here mpdes permits around the world you click on the states and you can see what mpdes permit issuing authority they have and what they may not have and some states have a long list of the different in other words they're generally categorized by um types of industries um uh and what activity is going on in the land um and, you know so the some states have a long list of what they've been authorized to administer. Some have a very short list. Some have a mixed bag. Um, you know, one example, for example, is, you know, Idaho doesn't issue KFU permits. They leave that to the EPA, but they issue all kinds of other NPDES permits. Um, uh, I believe that I'm correct in saying that the Idaho is one of the one such state. Um, now, there's also a, a link here for the MPDES State Program Authority, which sends you to the individual state websites individually, you know, uh, and, and and therefore you can start looking around if you don't happen to be in PA or if you're in West Virginia or you got a client in Ohio or whatever. Um, and then here's PA's DEP, uh, you know, MPDES permitting uh, uh, website, this link right here. So. Um, so that's a good resource to begin to create order out of chaos. Uh, okay, now, order out of chaos. Well, how about chaos out of order? Uh, because now you also have all sorts of exceptions and exemptions um, to uh, one, one way or another, an MPDES permit is not required for certain things. And the places where you can find those are all over the place um, uh, or you, where you can find them explained. Uh, or all over the place. So 
you know, sometimes they're e they're characterized as they're just not a pollutant. It was, or it's not a point source, uh, or the activity is just expressly exempt from permit requirements. Doesn't say those first two, uh, you know, uh, findings, so to speak. For example, silviculture, forestry, and uh, production of various forestry products, etc. Um, silviculture pest control is not a point source pollutant. Doesn't require an MPDES permit. Also, silviculture activities, there's a long list of them. No M M M P D E S permit. Um, even though you're tearing up the land, you know, or you're tearing up ground and you're producing things that normally for others would be considered, um, uh, you know, clearly within those activities that would require a permit because they're going to result in some type of addition of a pollutant to a water of the United States. Um, now, <clears throat> Um, irrigation return flow, uh, which are, are, you know, general, although, you know, clearly not an activity, uh, that we see a lot of in, uh, Pennsylvania, you know, discharge from some type of a tile drainage system that you may have, you know, on a, on a farm, uh, to recycle your, uh, storm water and or irrigation water, um, that, that does not require a permit expressly just says it right out in the statute. Um, so there's, there's a lot of that going on that you have to understand too. Now, um, the, the one of the key ones is agricultural stormwater discharge, which we'll see in a minute. Now, just hang on to that thought for a second. Now, now in a wetlands, and that's generally, you know, uh, if you're going to do anything in an area that is in any way, shape, or form a wetlands, um, you know, then uh, there is, a, you know, there's that's, that is an activity on the surface that is likely to produce um a uh, or will produce some type of uh, uh, discharge of something that qualifies as a pollutant. Um, uh, if you're in there digging up things, tearing things up, reshaping the land, recontouring, digging ditches, you know, do it, filling, doing fill, whatever you might be doing. Um, and there is an exception for um, uh, normal farming activities. If, and there's this sort of, this is not a, this is not in the statute, the language sort of a creature of case law prior established and continuing so uh if you make changes in your farm that's different but if this is something like your your regular routines and and this is a very complicated issue so i don't mean to make you know uh, make it seem easy um uh, then there is this normal farming activities um uh, exception for um uh disturbing a wetland uh now there's an entire it's called generally called a section 404 uh, exemption. Uh, and there's an entire webpage on them from both EPA and the Army Corps of Engineers, who also has joint, uh, you know, enforcement uh, and administration uh, duties. Um, uh, and it's pretty too complicated to get into right here, but with regard to the Clean Water Act. And, you know, here's an example of some of those activities. So there, you know, there you have some other types of, you know, um, uh, exemptions and you know things that create you know a little bit more chaos out of you know order okay now so what's all this about kfo permits <clears throat> we just saw you I, I just showed you that thing that said that there was a an exemption for agricultural or an exception for agricultural stormwater discharge you think about it for a second um you know well wait a minute isn't that exactly what you're worried about with a CAFO that's the manner in which um there is a discharge stormwater hits the ground washes you know things that may be on the surface um you know into some type of drainage you know natural occurring drainage system or a, a man made occurring uh, or a man made created drainage system so um now here's what here's the situation. This this agricultural stormwater discharge exception did not get added to the statute until 1987. Uh, the original language is what I have here on the, in the middle of the page here, and that's where they mentioned concentrated animal feeding operation as a specifically named port, point source in 1972. So while there is this agricultural stormwater discharge exception um, to that you know, to, to being a point source, it doesn't apply to concentrated animal feeding operations, i.e. what we now call a CAFO. And, and so um, <clears throat> that is, you know, essentially the crux of, a, 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 of some tension there um, that has led to, you know, a lot of uh, dissatisfaction. Um, now, what, uh, and as a result of, you know, 
this sort of, uh, you know, how are we going to regulate concentrated feeding, uh, animal feeding operations, uh, and also administer an agricultural stormwater discharge um, exception? Yeah, as a result, and I this is truly the definition of labyrinthian. There's this labyrinthian system that has been created that has generally been dissatisfactory to you know or unsatisfactory to everyone involved with it. Um, you know, with regard to the MPDES permitting of CAFUs. Here are a list, this page full of uh, all sorts of resources um, off of EPA's uh, website. They, they have some very well done things there. Um, and, uh, you know, helpful for a general practitioner or anyone trying to understand. And frankly, this permit writer's manual, even though it was in the mid 2000 teens, uh, like, I forget what the date is on it. it, might be 2015 or 2016, which shouldn't seem old at this point, but, you know, it's it's at least 10 years old, I think, or it's getting there. Um, maybe it's 2014, so maybe we're just at the 10 year. Anyway, this is an excellent resource. You want to read something that gets you right into this and you understand it? Read that. That's it. That's why I put the green star next to it. Okay, next. Now, here's the regulatory scheme. This is going to, you know, your brain may start, you know, getting a little, you know, glossed over here. We'll, we'll cut through it. Um, okay. First, you have to be an AFO, an animal feeding operation, the bigger category uh, before. And, and this is sort of the regulatory choice choice they made in order in order to they had the, you know, they got this, this section of the statute right here where concentrated animal feeding operation is mentioned. Uh, but what is that going to mean? Um and so regular, and through the regulations, it's been defined. First, they define an AFO, an animal feeding operation. And, whoop, sorry. There we go. Uh, means a lot of facility other than aquaculture where animals have been or will be stable or uh, housed, uh, confined, fed, maintained for a total of 45 days or more in any 40, or as in any 12 month period. Doesn't have to be the same 45 day, 45 or excuse me, doesn't have to be the same animals, doesn't have to be the same, you know, a contiguous 45 days. It's any any compilation of 45 days over uh, uh, any 12 month period and crops, vegetation, forage, et cetera, is not are not sustained in the normal growing season over any portion of the lot. So in other words, it's not a you know, it's not pastured, it's not grazed. Uh, it is, you know, a uh, place to house animals for the purpose of feeding them feed brought in from outside. Um, okay, so that's the first uh, threshold. Now you get into the CAFO under that. Um, now, there are two categories of CAFOs, large and medium, and they, and they uh, have different definitions. Um, now, it, it is, um, <clears throat> let me see if there's anything else here. Okay, there is also, uh, be, besides these definitions, of large and uh, medium, which we'll get to in a second. There's also just a flat out, either the local state authority or the EPA can just declare something a CAFO due to perhaps very poor, um, you know, stormwater runoff controls, very poor practices in place. Something can be declared a CAFO, even though it doesn't meet the other regulatory definitions. It's kind of important uh, to know because it's actually been used, uh, it's been referenced, let's say, as a threat uh, that could be, could be uh, come to, you know, come to fruition should, um, you know, Pennsylvania's um, efforts to uh, uh, meet the uh, Chesapeake Bay obligations at some point in time, and we're not going to get into that, um, you know, that CAFOs might, or, or animal operations that are not meeting the deregulatory definition might be declared CAFOs anyway and need MPDES permits um, uh, in Pennsylvania. Uh, in any event, uh, this is where the complication starts a little bit, but uh, a large CAFO is kind of easy. If, if it houses an, a, a specific number of animals by species, and I'll show you the chart in a minute, for 45 days or more in a 12 month period. Uh, so that's, that's kind of easy. Medium is the next size down. Um, and so it's an animal number criteria as well as a manner of the discharge. In other words, how are things, how is stormwater, for example, getting into 
Uh, is it just completely natural, um, you know, sloping of the land, et cetera, or are things being channeled through some type of a, you know, man-made, you know, it can be through natural components like dirt and, you know, but it's, if it's constructed by man, um, uh, and, um, <clears throat> It's either through that type of a channel or it's directly being discharged into some type of water of the United States that actually passes through the property and um, uh, or to which the actually it would be um, in any of it or I should say um, uh, the objective being that, you know, the animals are having direct contact in some way, shape, or form with the uh, with the water that's passing through. Um, so the classic that you see in my part of the state, unfortunately, you still see is, you know, the cow standing in the stream. Um, okay, now, here are the animal numbers. Just know this exists. There's no reason to be like, you know, hyper, you know, concentrating on this. These are the numbers for a large CAFO. So if you meet these numbers of these species, uh, and you do the 45 days and over any 12 month thing, you're in. You're you're a large uh, uh, CAFO and you need a large CAFO permit. Has a different set of the effluent limitations incorporated into it, or it you know it have a different com set of components of those different kind of components of the permits that we talked about before. Technology based narratives, etc. Okay, um, this is the medium CAFO uh, chart, and you can see you know again. It's reduced numbers um, uh, for various species. So, you know, what's this all about? Well, obviously, it's all about how much manure they're going to be producing, um, you know, as a species. Um, and uh, so uh, that's essentially the system. A little brain numbing, maybe, um, but that's how the system works. Now, oh, before I go on, the reason... <clears throat> There is such a thing then as a small CAFO. And if you hear the word small CAFO, that just means your animal numbers, you've met the other criteria, but your, your animal numbers do not um, uh, meet this standard for the medium CAFO. All right, so that's what it's at a small CAFO. That's an informal sort of term that's been invented to say all the others that don't qualify for large or medium CAFOs and need an MPDES permit, small CAFO doesn't need an MPDES permit because it's under these limits. That part, kind of simple. Now, again, remember about the state to state variability, because, again, if you say, uh, oh, I'm a, you know, uh, I, I need a CAFO permit in Oregon or, you know, somebody that may, that may not mean the same thing as, you know, somebody who, who needs a CAFO permit in Pennsylvania or Idaho or Missouri or, you know, so it can be very hard to compare data to data. Generally, when, you know, those who wish to try to engage in that sort of thing. Um, you know, from various states, you know, deal with the large CAFO category only uh, because that's generally easier uh, to isolate and uh, is generally more universally used in, um, uh, I guess I'll say more states, uh, but there could be other variables in there too. All right, now here's some numbers just to give you. Remember those? Remember that goal back in uh, 1972? Here are the latest numbers of just a compilation from EPA of um, CAFO permits, um, or I, I should say total CAFOs, and then what uh, the CAFO permit numbers are, whether EPA issued them or whether the state uh, issued them in that particular state. Um, and here's the total. Quite a number, 21,179 total CAFOs, um, and then 6,174 uh, that have permits. Now, there are reasons for that sometimes, which some of it has to do with the variability between states uh, criteria. But the bottom line is, um, you know, this is what causes dissatisfaction with some, is that this number should not be, these two numbers here should not be so far apart. Um, particularly after in 1972, they were announcing that this was all going to be done by 1985. Uh, in any event, that's a rash oversimplification, but you get the gist, which is this, this is the kind of numbers that can get distorted and, you know, um, uh, are hard to analyze in a vacuum. In any event, 
let's talk, that's CAFO permitting, all right? So now you know a little bit about CAFO permitting, if you never knew anything about CAFO permitting, and why you need them, and what the structure is, you know, and so you know you got the federal, you got a state program that's going to potentially have various variations in the state, maybe, between that and the federal standards. If not, then it's just the straight uh, federal standards applying, and, you know, you get the gist of it. Now, let's talk about another area of agriculture that needs MPDES permitting. Other types of discharges, that's what we're basically going to now. We're we, Clean Water Act's about point source discharges, you know, uh, into waters of the United States. And let's talk about other types of point sources. Um, uh, you know, it's interesting that, um, just can't hold that in your mind that, you know, a, a you know, animal, a, a concentrated animal feeding operation isn't a pipe, you know, uh, generally, you know, it's generally a mechanism, which is, you know, stormwater runoff. Um, uh, but yet it's a point source. There's a little tension there. Um, now, um, meat and poultry processors have their own complete category of MPDES permitting all about their processing facility and what's coming out the other end. They might have a rendering works in there and they might have all kinds of different things that they do in there. They have their own affluent limitations that are set by regulation, and uh, they weren't revised since twenty four. No, excuse me, two thousand and four. Well, now they're in the process of being revised, and there was just a proposed rule to greatly increase the effluent limitations, meaning the standards of how clean the discharge has to be, um, if at your point source discharge, and uh, also. <clears throat> keep in mind that there are such as the uh, point source discharge um, can also be somebody who is discharging into a public uh, publicly owned treatment works or a POTW is the terminology. So there are such a thing as direct dischargers uh, who clearly are discharging, you know, have their own, you know, treatment facilities on their side of the property line, so to speak. And, they are discharging something that has to meet a certain standard because it's going directly into the water of a creek, for example. Uh, and then you have indirect dischargers who are in this category who are just hooked up to a pipe that goes to their municipal uh, wastewater system in some way. They're both impacted by these effluent limitations. And essentially, this new proposed rule is going to greatly increase the economic burden on them to improve, or, or I should say necessary to improve, you know, whether it's a direct or an indirect discharge. This comes at a time when, of course, uh, many people are crying out for more meat and poultry processing uh, capacity in our country, and that too few people uh, uh, own, you know, a uh, uh, have cornered the market in their area for, you know, uh, where to sell, uh, you know, chickens, you know, swine, uh, cattle, Etc. So, uh, difficult, difficult thing for that industry to be going through at the present time. Uh, next, uh, there are MPDES permits for food manufacturers for industrial stormwater. You know, the Clean Water Act has you know gotten to a point where, well, just you know, if you got a large factory, you're going to have stuff outside. You're going to have things that, you know, rainwater is going to pick up things. Uh, you know, um, you know, got, you know, got barrels of this over here. You got skids of this over here. You have, you know, whatever it may be. So there is a whole litany of uh, requirements for various uh, food, they call it food and kindred products facilities. And here's just sort of a list of all of the uh, types of facilities that may very well have uh, a, a requirement for an industrial stormwater permit in addition to whatever it is that is coming out of their direct or indirect discharge that is, you know, uh, sewage, so to speak, you know, their stormwater discharges too, depending on, you know, wherever they're going um, and however they're, you know, uh, hooked up, so to speak. Um, uh, also have to have a separate permit and have all this criteria sort of uh, um, incorporated into their permits for how it's to be handled. So that's another way that agriculture, that Clean Water Act and agriculture sort of, um, you know, interface with, you, with each other. Now, last topic, what discharge or discharges into what waterways? I kind of laugh here because the cub is the, we're back to the waters of the United States. That's sort of the last piece of the definition. We talked about it a little bit before, but 
just going to wrap up again with that and say, you know, wow, navigable waters or navigable is the term in the statute. Waters of the United States. Oh, well, that was easy. No possible legal issues there, right? Well, wrong, of course. There has been decades of litigation over this, uh, but now we live in a much simpler time, let's hope. Um, you know, the, the much simpler time, you know, came as of last year when the U.S. Supreme Court decided the Sackett case uh, in May of 2023. Um, and essentially the gist, and I know I'm an, op an eternal optimist that I would actually um, uh, say that this should be simple, but um, essentially you need a continuous surface connection between something that you're going to call a water of the United States and what would be traditionally, you know, a, you know, a very, uh, uh, you know, uh, easy to recognize the water of the United States. Um, and so um, there, what this did in essence was it, it wiped out years and years of litigation and volumes and volumes of legal analysis, argument, case law, et cetera, with regard to the wetlands that may surround what is a traditional lake, stream, river, or ocean. Uh, and there was all this buildup over the decades about jurisdictional wetlands, meaning within EPA's jurisdiction, because they're somehow connected hydrologically to these more traditional uh, uh, water, you know, surface water. Uh, and so at this point, a physical surface connection, a continuous surface connection is needed between a wetland and a more traditional water stream, river, lake, ocean. Uh, in order for a wetland to be considered a water of the United States. That is seismic. That is complete sea change, no pun intended. Um, now, Sackett, uh, the, the, the hook in Sackett was is that it was, this, the, the decision was rendered right when the um, WOTUS definition was being amended by regulation. Then EPA tailored their already in process promulgation of a regulation to the Supreme Court decision. And now nobody likes the result. So we have litigation going on over the over what the EPA has essentially committed in their regulations as a final rule, uh, interpreting the Sackett case. Nobody likes, you know, how they've interpreted the Sackett case. Everybody wants more wants more uh, specificity. Um, but the bottom line is the Sackett case just wiped out just. Uh, just an immense amount of legal wrangling that has been going on for decades uh, and makes this simpler, maybe not simple. Uh, okay, now life should be good, ready? Uh, right, you know, maybe, I don't know, it's like those shirts that say life is good, maybe. Um, so here's another way of looking at, the, this is the actual terminology more or less. The, 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 the um, way that the WOTUS, uh, the SACA case was interpreted by EPA is territorial seas, interstate waters, or water susceptible to use in interstate or foreign commerce, or tributaries thereto, or wetlands adjacent, and we'll get to what adjacent means, which are relatively permanent, standing, or continuously flowing, and have a continuous surface connection thereto. That's the water of the United States now. You boil it all down. No such thing as the so-called interstate wetlands or jurisdictional wetlands that are hydrologically connected, but not on the surface. I know I'm simplifying it. There are many who would say that there's more holes in it than that. But the bottom line is that's all gone away, this idea of the interstate or jurisdictional wetlands. Adjacent, as it is used in here, it means a continuous surface connection. EPA admitted to that. So that should simplify things, of course, you know. Uh, that's that's always an optimistic view of, uh, of things. All right, Audrey? Clearly, this topic you know, lends itself to multiple uh, future webinars on Clean Water Act um, and agriculture and um, all of that. So thank yeah. you all so much for joining us this afternoon. Thank you, Brooke, for a great presentation. And we encourage you to check out our events page. Um, join us again for agritourism laws in July. We've got U.S. state milk pricing and supports part two in July. H2A Temporary Ag Worker Pro Program in August, and then stay tuned for more information. Mark your calendars for the Pennsylvania Ag Law Symposium, September 19th. We're excited um, to hopefully see some of you in person. So thanks so much for joining us. Have a great weekend, all. Mm -hmm.